This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, episode 110. This week, we ride the Wayback Machine all the way north of the border to learn about the often overlooked Avril Lancaster bomber. So let's get those props turning. Roll it. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, former U.S. Air Force F-16 pilot, Trevor Boswell. Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Boat, and I'm taking a break from the airline training world for another installment of the Warbird series. We'll jump into the interview in a minute, but first, I wanted to pass a huge thanks to everyone I met and spoke with down at Sun and Fun this past week. It was really great seeing you all and putting faces to names and voices, as well as watching the first F-18 Super Hornet Blue Angels performance. Pretty amazing stuff, and I'll tell you, those things are a touch louder than I can remember. And man, so many warbirds. It was so incredible to see all the different types of aircraft that were out there on the ramp. All the classics, F-4s, T-6s, T-34s, T-28s. I mean, there are just so many to mention, like six P-51s, a couple P-40s, just great stuff. And it does include next month's topic, the P-51. So just an incredible to be out there with everybody, seeing everything out there and being amongst the crowd. Just great air show. Really had a great time with all that. As well, I was actually fortunate enough to be able to catch up with our guest, Larry Kelly, back from the uh, B-25 episode, episode 98. He and his airplane, Panchito, were out there and flew in the show. And man, just an amazing piece of history, like we talked about in the show. And getting to actually climb into it, feel it, see it up close and personal was absolutely great. I really appreciated them taking the time to sit down and talk with me about it yet again. I will say, though, that uh, I'm six foot three, and man, I was not exactly their target audience when they designed that thing. But what a great airplane and a surreal feeling climbing into something that has so much history beyond just what we talked about on the show. I highly recommend going and checking out the uh, Delaware Aviation Museum and getting out there firsthand if you possibly can. On the uh, flip side, though, a little bit of sad news to report. As everyone's probably well aware at this point, there was a TBM Avenger that was forced to ditch in the waters off of Cocoa Beach, Florida this past weekend, actually Sunday uh, at the end of the uh, show. Basically, just unable to sustain enough power for flight is what the uh, initial reports look like. There is a ton of footage out there of you, uh, the uh, beachgoers, kind of watching the final approach and finally all the way down to touchdown. And then uh, fortunately, some of them were nice enough to go out and help out. But uh, they have retrieved it off of the uh, or out of the water and we're able to pull it up onto the beach. But you know, at the end of the day, fortunately, it looks like it can be re- restored. So that's awesome. And hopefully, uh, you know, they'll be able to do that quickly. But uh, from initial reports, it looks like it'll probably take a couple years to do so. But if anybody out there is interested and so inclined, you can head on over to www.valiantaircommand.com and you can donate some money towards that restoration process and help get that warbird back in the air. So pretty crazy stuff, highs and lows of an air show, I guess. Thankfully, everybody was able to walk away and uh, hopefully that airplane will live to see another day. But with all that covered, we'll head straight in the interview on the Lancaster with today's guest, Mr. Leon Evans. And I'm not the Jerry Seinfeld of this world, and I'll apologize up front for my horrid attempt at British humor, but hopefully you can forgive me. Other than that, enjoy it. All right, well, welcome back, everyone, to yet another installment of Bother. Wait, it's it's not Bomber Month again. Sorry about that. Nah, not really. I had you going for a second, didn't I? Well, guests, I'll have to work on my dry humor. And well, speaking of dry humor, today we're going to be discussing the British designed Avro Lancaster. See what I did there? Well, and to learn more about that, we have Mr. Leon Evans with us. Leon, how are you doing today, sir? I am doing well. Trevor, how are you doing? I am fantastic. I'm actually here in uh, Boston. Uh, a little bit of my Boston accent coming out. Oh, yeah. Hell of a coffee. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm here on a layover. You, sir, where are you uh, located? I'm in a little town called Font Hill. It's up on the escarpment just west of Niagara Falls, Ontario, uh, about 10 miles west. So I can look out my yard and I can almost see the... If I get up on the roof, I can see the falls. Yeah, a little of the mist anyway. A little bit, yeah. Well, it sounds fancy. It sounds beautiful. You know, unfortunately, I'm, I was unable to, to make it up there. I really would like to come up and obviously see the caster that you have. And we'll talk obviously much more about that one. But Let's get started with a little bit of a background behind you and why you're here to talk about the Lancaster today. And 
this amazing piece of aviation history. So you're currently the chief pilot of the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum. Is that located near where you live? Yeah, it's uh, west of me by about 25 miles. It's uh, Hamilton, Ontario at the uh, Hamilton International Airport. It's been there since uh, 1975, and it started with a firefly, a fairy firefly, and the collection has grown to um, 42 airplanes with uh, 18 of them that we fly. Our present uh, CEO and chairman is uh, Captain Dave Rohr, who's been with us as long as I've been there. He hired me, basically. When I say hired, I don't get paid, so I'm a volunteer. (laughs) But I get paid in glory, believe me. That's amazing. That's really cool. Well, I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be a cool conversation. I don't really know a whole lot about the Lancaster, other than you know maybe a little bit here and there, a smattering, because I think here in the U.S., you know, we like to focus on our own, and I think most countries probably do that as well. But the B-17 is kind of one of those European warfighter type of aircraft that World War II was famous for. The Lancaster may be a bit overshadowed and some of that due to its mission set. But back to a little bit about you, how did you get from childhood all the way up to uh, where you are today? Trevor, I've always wanted to fly airplanes like most pilots. You know, we start very young in life, most of us anyhow. I lived in a little town in South Devon, England uh, called Exmouth, but I'm a Welshman. I was mom and dad are Welsh. But anyhow, I used to watch airplanes doing spins and aerobatics. They were biplanes, of course, and over the River X, and I loved it. And then one day my mom came in and she said, pack your bags, we're going to Canada, eh? So uh, (laughs) we came right to St. Catharines, and um, of course, I joined Air Cadets, still loving airplanes. I became an air cadet and got a flying scholarship with the cadets when I was 17. And that was 1963. Jeez, how would I get this old? (laughs) And I ended up at that flying club and as an instructor, very fortunate years later, like yourself, went into the airlines, Air Canada gave me a break and uh, I was hired on the uh, good old Lockheed L-1011 as a second officer and did many airplanes after that. The rest is history, as they like to say, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My last flight, I took an Airbus 340 over to Frankfurt and flew back on a 330. So we had both airplanes, two versions of the 340. So it was kind of nice, Trevor, to finish up on both. I love the Airbuses. Sure. Some of my friends uh, don't appreciate me saying things like that. They think if you like an Airbus that you're uh, suffering from the Stockholm syndrome, you know. And it- <laughs> Well, that tray table is pretty nice, I'll tell you. Well, yeah, you tried to drink your uh, coffee on a Boeing and you got this wheel right in front of you. It keeps moving, you know. Uh, As an American, it's sacrilege to say. I know, but, I know. You know, <laughs> to each their own. I flew Boeings too, and I love the Boeing too. <laughs> They're all good in my book. They sure are. Well, that's yeah. great stuff and clearly an amazing career. You talked about your parents bringing you over from England. And how old about were you when you moved over? I was 11 years old when I came over. Do you remember much of your time prior to moving in England or? Yeah, I remember England. If uh, we hadn't come to Canada, I don't think I would have ended up as an airline pilot because the things are a little different over there. Yeah. It's tougher. Sure. When I say tougher, I mean when you're 11 years old in England, they direct you one way or the other to grammar school or secondary school. You're going to be a tradesman or you're going to, you know, yeah. guess what I was going to be? Carpenter or bricklayer. <laughs> <laughs> which is a useful skill all in, oh, yes. know, in its own right, for sure. <laughs> exactly. Well, very good. And I would say in the time that I've gotten to know you, that's their loss. <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they can uh, think about their choices. Yeah. All that being said, I'm really glad that you're here with us. Like I said, I don't know a ton about the Lancaster, so I'm looking forward to getting to learn a little bit more. And I know the listeners of our show are uh, definitely excited about it as well. So let's get started with the aircraft itself. And being that you have... How many years of experience flying the Lancaster now? I've been flying it now for 14 years. I've got 500 hours on it. I do a lot of the instructing on it now. All of the pilots on it are capable of instructing on it now because we've all been on it so long. Very cool. Yeah. And as far as your history and, and your connection to the past of the aircraft itself, do you know when this kind of started its process of development and what the initial design requirement was back when they began creating it? Yeah, the first airplane, it was Roy Chadwick that designed the airplane. It was designed as a Manchester, the Avro 679. Okay. It had two engines, and they needed um, engines of 2,000 horsepower. And that was where the problem started, because they didn't have any big engines. So what they tried to do was they took two Rolls-Royce Peregrine engines, bolted them together on a common crankshaft, called it a Vulture, and it was supposed to produce 2,000 horsepower. The airplane couldn't get the power because it was overheating. There were other issues with the engine, but bottom line was 
they couldn't get gross weight off the ground, let's put it that way, and it was unreliable. Okay. They ended up having to put a third fin on the top, so it still looked like a Lancaster, only with two engines. All right. So um, at that time, though, uh, Roy Chadwick was working on a new wing. He added six feet or so to each wing. It's a 102-foot wingspan now wow. and put four Merlins on. Now, Merlins were in demand at that time because the Battle of Britain was still – there was still a chance – that Germany could have invaded England, so they needed all of the Merlins for the fighters. But he managed to sneak four of them, and it was a match made in heaven, just like your P-51. Yeah. It was the match. Nothing wrong with the Allison engine, I'll add, right now, but for higher altitudes, the Merlin was the answer. So along comes the Lank with a two-speed single-stage supercharger, and that was the big advantage of that engine. The engine never changed, uh, Trevor. You know, the Merlin engine. Same one from the start to finish, huh? Yeah. You know, you mentioned the B-17. Over in England, the Lancaster, every time that thing took off from the Midlands, those heavy weights climbing across the English Channel in the southern country that had been pummeled with bombers, you know, from Germany, it meant to the English people, the war's going the other way now. Yeah. So I made the mistake when I was down at Jerry Yagan's in uh, Virginia Beach, walking a, a good group of Americans around our wonderful little airplane there and uh, say how wonderful the Lancaster was and it won the war. Well, hold it. Just a minute. <laughs> Just a minute. You know, so, yeah, the B-17 was great too, but. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah. They all had their role. And yeah. one of the differences between the B-17 and the Lancaster was the fact that the Lancasters were flown primarily as the night attack option. Yes. Is that as an accurate statement? That's correct. Very cool. Yeah. And. When it came to development of the aircraft, can you talk through some of the variants and some semblance of order? I know there are a laundry list of variants. The Lancaster 1, the first Lancaster that came out, first of all, it had SU carburetors. Misunderstood as Stromberg updraft, but they're not. They're Skinner's Union carburetors, and they were float carburetors which had its uh, idiosyncrasies. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a woman named Tilly Schilling, but Beatrice it was her name. All right. She solved the initial problem of lean cuts and rich cuts with that engine. So, of course, when the B-2, that engine came out with the um, Hercules engine, they only made 300 of those. That is also the airplane you found the um, mid-under gun. The Mark III Lancaster is like our Mark 10. And one of the obvious differences right away is the idle cutoff on the Mark III is on the fuel cocks, one per engine. So you just close it and you're shutting off. Our airplanes uh, with the Packard Merlins, our engines are shut down with ICO, idle cutoffs. Okay. So there are four switches. That's the most obvious change. Okay. And then after that, Trevor, it was one modification after the other. That airplane was actually considered to carry the atomic bombs to Japan, believe it or not, because the B-29 they were having trouble fitting it in. Yeah. And the Lank has a 34-foot bomb bay. So, uh, of course, they took the doors off this Lancaster so they could carry the upkeep, the bouncing bomb, and the Grand Slam, the 22,000-pounder, and the 12,000 tall boy. Tall boy went after the turpits. When I was a kid in England, there was a kid in my class whose father put a torpedo into the turpits. So <laughs> it's a small world, really, when you think of it. Oh, wow. You know, Trevor... They went after the tur pits once out of Russia. They could barely make it. They had to use a Wellington bomber fuel tank as an additional fuel supply, removing all of the turrets. They did the attack. And the Germans come up with a smoke screen system that they could cover the airplane. Yeah. The second attack, they moved the tur pits to Tromso, the different uh, fjord. And this was great. They also moved a squadron of Messerschmitts up there so that when the captain on that turpits knew the bombers were coming and he'd have lots of time, he could get the fighters in the air to meet them. Yeah. Except they didn't tell the fighters where the ship had been moved to. They went to the other fjord and they sank that ship. Now, oh. they couldn't see the ship because of the cloud. So what did the guys on the ship do? Open up their cannons and firing and you look down and you could see a ring of fire. That's how they managed to hit it. Oh, boy. That was that airplane. Of course, the bouncing bomb, the Dan Buster movie, and Barnes Wallace and his bouncing bomb, and Guy Gibson, the leader of the 617 Squadron. Uh, that's a great movie in itself. And I, I hope some of your viewers, if they haven't seen it, will look at it. Going on from there, the airplane uh, not only dropped bombs, you know, they dropped 51 million firebombs in Germany. 51 millions or four pounders. Holy cow. Well, how cruel can war be, you know? Oh, definitely. So, yeah. 
We have a movie called Reunion of the Giants, which is a movie we made when we took the airplane over to England in 2014, and that's also worth having a look at, too. Maybe we'll send you a copy. Yeah, I would love to see that. That's great stuff. So you just covered a bunch of different kind of nuances between some of the variants and that kind of thing. Let's try to break it down maybe for the listener to see what we can you know, kind of garner from each of the different things. So as I look through my notes and the research that uh, our team has done on it, it looks like anywhere between maybe 10 different Mark labeled variants in here. Yep. How many total Lancasters were built across the whole war? North of uh, 8,000 or so? There were 7,377 built. Okay. And almost 60% of them were shot down, Trevor. My goodness. Almost 60. And one of your uh, gentlemen, John Clark, had asked about why was it so lightly armed. Well, it was a night bomber. They did come up with some uh, offensive weapons that uh, were a little unusual. One, of course, was the uh, Fraser Nash turrets. And one was a mid-under gun, like your ball turret on the B-17. Sure. Except it was pneumatically and hydraulically operated with a guy sitting on a stool, looking through a periscope, facing backwards and operating these controls. They couldn't hit anything with it. So it didn't work and they didn't include it. But of course, most of the Lancaster shot down were shot down because the tail gunner was killed and the airplane is at their disposal. They also came up with a gun on the tail. It was a radar-controlled gun, and the Brits, they loved the names. They called it Village Inn. It was an FN-121, FN-121, and it was an FN-120 also. But the radar-controlled gun, they would put those airplanes in the back of the pack and arm the radar so anybody sneaking up behind would get a surprise. Yeah. I mean, it was just numbers in World War II. That Lancasters were being built in Canada. We built 430. One a day came off the ramp out of the factory. but. You go down to Ypsilanti, where the B-24 was built, they were coming out one every 59 minutes. Yeah. You can't shoot them down that fast, you know? No way. Holy goodness. Yeah, that's amazing stuff. You talk to enough people that either lived through it or have spoken to others that had lived through that whole period. You go to the museums and you see the history there. Yeah. And you start to get a sense of just how big a logistics mess, essentially, that the war was. and then. You're never going to see that again, I don't think. No. You know, it's amazing stuff. Yeah, I think a world war now would be a whole different story, you know. Yeah, I don't think it would be a good one. No, I don't uh, think so. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so let's switch and let's go from kind of the outside of the aircraft to the inside of the aircraft and talk through the crew complement. So this bomber is unique. What is the one thing that kind of stands out that's unique about this that is different, I think, than probably any of the other bombers that were going to the war? Well, the first thing you're going to notice is the single pilot seat. Yeah, what's that about? Yeah, exactly. And one of your questions here was, uh, why did they only have one pilot? Well, if you get into the Lancaster, you should come up and have a look. Anybody's welcome to come up. But if you see that big seat sitting there, there's a narrow space on the right where there's a fold-up chair. That's where the co-pilot sits. All right. But in the war years, the crew chief would sit there, and there was only one wheel. Our airplane has two wheels, and so does the British Lancaster, which is the only other Lancaster flying in the world. Okay. If you imagine duplicating that seat and its space, that would make that airplane wider. What made the Lancaster so effective? It was narrower. Oh. And it was very fast, and it has a a huge uplift, a beautiful wing, four big Merlin engines. Uh, By the time that uh, war was going the other way, Trevor, they were using 160-octane fuel, and that engine was producing one horsepower per cubic inch, and it's got a 1,647-cubic-inch engine, 27.02 liter. The engine never changed. Yeah. What did change was the supercharger. The supercharger was a one-wheel, so it's a single-stage, single-speed. Our airplane has single-stage, two-speed, and later on in the war, they put the two-speed, uh, two-stage superchargers on the Merlin, and that's what you got in your P-51. Okay. At that point then, you know, a Spitfire 1939 could get to 20,000 feet in 10 minutes. 1943, it could get to 40,000 feet in 10 minutes. That was fuel only. Yeah. And the boost. So the other engine, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's the first thing that stands out. The other thing that stands out, Trevor, is when you climb into our Lancaster, you go in through the back door, you walk about 10 feet forward, you go up three stairs, you're going up on top of the bomb bay. All right. You can't get into our bomb bay like you can on the B-17, so the bombs on a Lancaster are wired so that when they fall out of the airplane, they're armed. Okay. 
which is a problem. You can only imagine an emergency landing. You sure don't want to be doing that with anything hanging in there because if anything breaks loose, it's going to be armed. Yeah. Then as you go forward, in order to keep the bomb bay 34 feet long and clear and wide open, they put the spars on top of it. So you climb over the first spar, the rear spar. You climb over the forward spar. That just about crotch height, actually. And uh, <laughs> we actually do have weddings and uh, we put the Lancaster as a backdrop and we've had the brides in there with their wedding dresses climbing over this spar. It's amazing. Some of the prettier things have come into that machine. Yeah. But then you're into the cockpit where you can then stand up. Once you get past the navigator's table, you can stand up in the cockpit, the glass canopy part. So that's room for the pilots, crew chief, and anybody else who wants to stand there. Navigator sat underneath the fuselage, just behind the pilots, and the radio man was behind him on the side. So all of us were forward of the main spar, the front spar. Okay. I know when we had discussions with some of the other guests about the other bombers, the other heavy bombers, the navigator sometimes was a dual role bombardier. Is that accurate in this case or how did they work that? On that airplane, we had a, in the nose, we had a, a nose gunner, of course. He was also the bomb aimer. Then you have the pilot and crew chief, all right. uh, navigator, radio operator. Radio operators were all called Spargy like original, you know, <laughs> and then going to the back uh, past the two spars, you have the mid upper gun. And then in the back, all on his own is the tail gunner. But he is connected throughout through intercoms and yeah, uh, anywhere. The, in the manuals that we have, they all had electric suits. Every tail gunner you ever talked to said, nah, those suits didn't work. We were always freezing. <laughs> when we took it over to England, we were freezing. It was very cold. We never thought to be quite honest that Parker might be handy. <laughs> but, but we dressed very lightly with our flight suits and the light jackets. And we looked pretty good, I must say. Sure. With our red faces and noses. and <laughs> <laughs> well, Looking good's half the battle. For oh, sure. Of course it is, yeah. Well, speaking of going uh, long distances, what kind of range was this aircraft capable of? We took the airplane from Goose Bay, Canada, for one hour out to the Atlantic coast and then across. The original plan was to land in, uh, in the Sarswak, Greenland, but we were able to stretch that all the way to Keflavik in Iceland and still have an hour of fuel. That's 10 hours of flying. But we took off at 53,000 pounds, which is our gross weight now for takeoff. Yeah. That's also our landing weight. That's why we have a gross weight of takeoff for 53. But we mm -hmm. weren't carrying 22,000 pounds of bombs. That'll do it. But we yeah. did have 2,154 imperial gallons of fuel, which is 15,500 pounds, plus the weight of the airplane, about 34,000 crew, another 2,000, and our bags, of course. To answer your question, that airplane could carry almost 22,000 pounds from uh, Midlands in England to Berlin. That's flying a dog leg. It's only 600 miles each way. Yeah, It could carry a lot. But again, 60% of them almost shot down, Trevor. You know, they were vulnerable. It's a daunting thing to look at the loss rate. Yes. And think that people are willingly going in there to do this. Yeah. But when it comes to protecting, you know, your country. The other thing with the Lancaster, the British loved the 303 gun. We have two in the nose, two on the top, on the top turret, and four in the tail turret. Those are the FN-50 was the Friso Nash 50 was the upper turret. And the FN-5 was the nose turret. Now you'd say, well, why don't you put 50s in them or cannons in it? But yeah. If uh, Lancaster could fly during World War II, it was on a raid. Simple as that. They weren't going to ground an airplane to change turrets. But if it was damaged and it had to be grounded for repair, they would switch them over. Okay. Like they did have the uh, Martin electric turret up in the top, and that was 50 calibers. They did have some 20 millimeter cannons in the tail eventually, but basically it was the 303. They just loved it. I think everybody probably loves a specific type of weapon and, and maybe the price is right too. We can't yes. forget, you know, obviously there is only so much manufacturing capability and maybe that was the one that had the most. So exactly. that definitely is potentially a, an issue kind of to one of the previous points about the armament. And one of our listener questions again from John Clark was lightly armed and talking about the machine gun types was the overlapping fire and everything else like that. The same kind of concept when it came to missions that the B-17s did during the daytime, or how did that change for their nighttime operations? Well, the guns are limited and have kill switches, so you can't shoot your tail off, and nobody can hit anybody else in the airplane. You can't damage your wings. So, yeah, they all had their coverage. Okay. The picture I have of the mid-under machine gun, that's the FN-64, the mid-under gun with a guy looking backwards. Uh, the rest of the airplane, the turrets, 
the top turret, the uh, mug, as we call it, the mid-upper gunner. And, mm-hmm. of course, our Lancaster is called the Minarski Memorial Lancaster. We acquired the airplane in uh, 1977, started restoration in 1978. This airplane had been sitting on a pedestal. Now, when I say pedestal, you know your plastic model airplanes, you have a little single stand. Yeah. When you put a big airplane on a single stand, you bend it, you ruin it. Yeah. So uh, the Goderich uh, Legion that had the airplane up there, they couldn't afford a nice cement pedestal, so they put it on three poles, and they just happened to put it on the lifting positions of the airplane. That's what saved that airplane, you know? That's great. So it survived that. It survived the war because it was built after the war. It also survived a great fire in 1993 where they had to pull it out of a hangar that was on fire, and they oh, saved wow. it. So this old girl, is, uh, she's had some uh, nine lives, you know? <laughs> yeah. She's got her own version of war stories. Yeah, it sure does. So getting back to kind of the missions, obviously it's a bomber and it's going to go attack uh, surface targets. What was, from your your experience talking to the folks that flew it or the people that built it, that kind of thing, what were the things that stood out to them about the aircraft that I guess made it so memorable beyond obviously it being the link, if you will? We get a lot of veterans. They're slowly disappearing. Yeah. But when you talk to them, they love their airplane. Like We all love our airplanes, Trevor, whichever one we're on. But uh, they all love that airplane. They said they believed that if it was shot down, if three quarters of it was shot down, the other quarter would make it back. So the engines, uh, you could fly with an airplane with two engines out on one side. Oh, wow. I've never had to try that. I wouldn't want to. And, of course, I (laughs) fly the airplane. Nobody's shooting at me either. But there have been some uh, incidents where they've been down to one engine above 10,000 feet and still maintaining straight and level flight. You're not going to go much other than keeping it straight and level so everybody can get out. But when we took the airplane over to England in uh, 2014, there were 84 veterans waiting for us. We tried to leave on August the 4th, and the number two engine wouldn't start. This is all in our movie, Reunion of Giants. The following day, they managed to find the coil, the electrical coil, which we hadn't used in years, all of a sudden was needed. I showed up the following day, and we took off, went to Goose Bay, Canada. Les spent the night. The following day, went over to Iceland, spent a couple of days, and then August the 8th, We had to arrive in England in a rainstorm, but all of those vets were there and thousands of people. We had to make it if it was safe. Yeah. So we were coming into Coningsby Air Force Station and the weather was coming and we managed to uh, get past it. Very cool. Race against time. Race against time. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what they said. They all loved their airplane and uh, they felt very safe with it, but there's very little protection. I mean, it's 30 thousandths of an inch thick skin all around it. There was a metal plate behind the pilot's head. You know, when you, we mentioned earlier about single pilot operation, you know, one stray bullet killed the pilot. You got yourself an airplane. They're not training. They didn't have standby pilots. They, everybody seems to think, well, maybe the navigators, maybe some navigators had learned to fly. Yeah. Maybe they became a navigator because at that time they didn't need pilots. And that happened, too. But it wasn't a plan. There was no, like, no. we're going to have a backup guy there just in case and he's going to do something. And extra. Trevor, I be at fault if I didn't mention that the reason we call this airplane the Andrew Minarski Memorial Lancaster. Andrew Minarski was the mid-upper gunner the night the airplane got shot down. This airplane only had 46 hours on it when it was shot down. That's brand new. Wow. We spent almost that many hours flying across the Atlantic and back. When he was the last one to get out, all the engines were shut down, and each turret is operated by a single hydraulic pump on each engine. So number one engine would run the mid-under gun, number two was the nose, number three was the upper, and number four was the tail gun. And I might have got that wrong. Who knows? But He noticed his friend, Pat Brophy, stuck in the tail gun position, and the tail gun was so crowded, you couldn't keep your parachute with you, Trev, so the tail gunners kept their parachutes inside the airplane behind the clam doors of the turret. Okay. He can't move his turret because the engines are dead, and Andrew went back, and the airplane at this point is on fire from all of the hydraulic fluid, which at those days burned, Yeah. and he was burning while he tried to chop Pat Brophy out of the turret. Pat Brophy was not only his friend, his roommate. And the only reason we know this is because Pat Brophy sat back down in his seat and rode the empty airplane down and it crashed in a field in France. It didn't turn upside down. The turret come off, but it, that's the beauty of the Lancaster. It stalls out so lovely and flies level. Andrew died of his burns. Pat survived the war. We did the first flight after 10 years of restoration 
So that was 1988, September the 11th, first flight. All of the crew was there for the initial flight, except Andrew, of course. Isn't that amazing, eh? That's amazing. Yeah, so we call it the Andrew Minarski Memorial Lancaster. I think as uh, you sent me a bio, yes, I wanted to say there was like a mention of Vera or something to that as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. To, uh, our registration is Charlie Golf Victor Romeo Alpha. So if you see the registration, V-R-A, everybody knows it as Vera. Now, the interesting thing, when we got it over to England, we put it in a hangar for the first night, and somebody mentioned the British airplane at that time was called Thumper. Okay. And our airplane was called Vera. And we thought, now, wait a minute. We leave those two alone in the hangar overnight, you never know. (laughs) You just never know. Yeah, there were no baby airplanes there the following day, so. Sadly. That's not how they're made. <laughs> no, no, no. But it was wonderful to see these two fly together. Uh, Lancasters hadn't flown together in over 50 years. Isn't that crazy? We did 60 events, Trevor. You think of like the fact that there are over 7,000 of these made. Yeah. And there's only two that are flying around. Now, there is one over there also called Just Jane, and it's at East Kirkby, and it's just east of uh, Coningsby Air Force Station where the British lancasters is based uh, it's their organization is called the battle of britain memorial flight so they have spitfires okay. and hurricanes and they restore and engines and everything else it's a wonderful organization similar to the heritage flight organization that yeah does exactly stuff like ours too and i mean you have living history flight experiences ours is not quite so glamorous it's called the exemption to 700.02 dash Two dash A, you know, <laughs> like some kind of legalese. Yeah. So, like your <laughs> LHFE, it gives us a chance to sell rides in our airplanes, and that's how we keep these airplanes going. Yeah. You can buy a ride in the Lancaster; it's expensive, but then you know it's one of a kind. And yeah, you mentioned the skin being one thirty thousandth of an inch thick. Is that right? On the average, I help restore a Bolingbroke bomber, and uh, thirty to forty two thousandths of an inch was all it was. Well, Trevor, your thumbnail is around 30 thousandths of an inch thick. So it doesn't stop bullets. No, that sounds pretty crazy. And and I mean, you think about space flight and that's kind of some yeah. of the thicknesses of the walls of the spacecraft back in, you know, I think the Apollo missions and yeah. whatnot, but I'm tending to believe that there was no pressurization. Not in the Lancaster. No, yeah. there wasn't pressurization there. What else can I ask about this thing? I, I mean, it's obviously you talked about kind of being a little bit narrower than your typical bomber. Any other kind of nuances that maybe you can pull out it had some great features well it did have a heating system by the way there's uh, radiators in the leading edges in between the fuselage and the inboard engines on each side and all it does it takes the it's a heat exchanger okay which takes the hot water from the uh, coolant system in the inboard engines and gave us some heat now when we took it over to england yet yeah, we could smell the heat we just couldn't feel it that was the problem i see Yeah, different variations of the airplane for the different roles it was assigned to do it was just a very successful four-engine bomber that could carry a heavy weight and travel a long distance and at fairly good speeds. Speaking of speeds, what kind of cruise speed did they have? And then for normal employment, where would they stay at? We run the airplane at two pounds of boost with uh, 2,200 RPM. So uh, over in North America, we refer to boost as inches, of course, inches of mercury. But if you take 29.92 inches and divide it by 14.7 pounds per square inch, you get 2.03 with a repeating decimal. Well, basically, then one pound is equal to two inches of mercury. So we take off with nine pounds of boost, so that's 18 inches, plus the standard atmospheric pressure, which would be, say, 30. So you'd be at 48 inches. If we got into trouble with this airplane, we could take the boost from nine pounds, and that's nine pounds at the gate. And we can move the throttles slightly left and drive them forward to the stop. And that'll give us 14 pounds of boost. So there's 14, 28 plus 30, 58 inches of mercury. If you really had a bad day, we have an auto boost control. It's a little red knob right beside the four fuel cocks in the instrument panel that the pilots control the engines with. You can break this little witness wire and pull the red lever back. And that'll give you 18 pounds of boost. So 36 plus 30, 66 inches. And what that really did, Trevor, it just simply opened the butterfly in the carburetor to full. All right. And you're only ever going to need that feature if you've taken off, if somebody's jumped in, you shot out one of your engines and you got a full load of bombs and you don't want to do a belly landing with it, you'd go to maximum power. And if we ever use that system, the uh, 18 pounds, then the engines have to be rebuilt. But it's better to rebuild an engine than have an airplane go down with seven people on board and 
you know, make a big hole somewhere. Oh, yeah. So as for equipment, it did have a lot of equipment. It had some, one called H2S, which um, they call it stinky because it's H2S, like H2S04, the, the rotten egg smell. Yep. But it was ground mapping radar. Oh, wow. And that came in pretty handy, you know, yourself. Especially um, at nighttime, right? Yeah. At nighttime, yeah. You can pick yeah. up cities and rivers, and sometimes that's the feature you need if you're in a cloud condition, you know, and you, you can't point. see the target. Did they also have the Norton Bob site at all, or did they have their own? The Norton Bomb site, you yes. Did? Okay. Yeah, we had right. that. Of course, the difference, too, is, you know, you watch... Uh, the B-17 in operation and the uh, navigator will tell, the bomb aimer will tell the captain, I've got her, you know, and he switches over and he can control the heading. Yes. But with the Lancaster, the uh, bomb aimer would say left a bit, right a bit, you know, <laughs> back a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Very good stuff. And I've done an interview on a B-29. I've done an interview on a B-25. This is the first one I'm seeing anything related to electronic warfare. Do you have any experience with that? No, I don't. Does your aircraft have any of this kind of equipment still on it? No, it doesn't. What we did, we basically gutted our airplane and we carry four passenger seats on the left-hand side of the airplane on the bomb bay. They have a little window they can look out. We didn't install the windows. They were always there. All right. And then we have four passengers, four crew. With exceptions, we can carry a fifth person. So like I said, there's electronic warfare stuff in there. They talk with code words like window and tinsel and stuff. Yeah. We gutted our airplane to carry the four passengers. If you go on the British Lancaster, which you can't, Trevor, they won't let you on their airplane. It's the Queen's airplane, and uh, you can't even get near it to touch it. But with our four seats, well, we have the guns, but we don't carry the bullet racks and things like that. They have everything in their Lancaster that the airplane had, from the flare guns installed and the flare holders. And But ours was basically gutted to make the airplane make money because people want to see it, not necessarily get in it. Yeah. But when we took it to air shows in England, they were just ecstatic that they could come over. I'd encourage them, come on over, get some Lancaster oil on you because it's dripping everywhere, you know. <laughs> so they just loved it. It is a special airplane to the British. It really is. Oh, definitely. I think anybody would yeah, be proud to, yeah. to have an aircraft of this quality. So, no, when we did take her over then, so for navigation, we had an installed Garmin 650 ES extended squitter. We had the Garmin uh, transponder, the GTX-33, which is a remote transponder that is activated through the Garmin 650. Okay. And that's certified. We could do a Cat 1 approach with that, Trevor. Oh, cool. But we weren't really legal to, but we could if we had to. We had the HSI to go with it. All right. And we were all fairly current. I say fairly because I've been retired a few years at the time, but I know how it's done. Yeah. The other piece of equipment we had was a carry-on Garmin. And it was another touchscreen, a GTN. And that was the 796. We kept that in front of us on the instrument panel mounted. You can't do approaches, of course, with a carry-on, but it was the one we used the most. Okay. Because it was right there and Garmin. It doesn't get much better. Oh, sure. I uh, often tell people when they see the Garmin, well, Adolf Hitler, he had the rockets to put the satellites up. We got the GPS. So uh, if we'd have waited a little longer for that war, who knows? Oh, yeah. So that was, you know, obviously current day technology and you've got GPS and you've got all this fancy stuff. What were they using to navigate in war? In addition to H2S, the mapping radar, they had the OVO. They had a system where they could have two beams and they could just go to where the two beams intersect. Somewhere along the line, they'd have to fly along one beam and wait till they hit the second beam and let their bombs go there. When you say beams, you're talking like radio frequency. Radio frequency beams, yeah. Remember the old uh, dot dash and the dash dot, the range? Yeah, a little Morse code going on and all uh, that. Yeah, I wasn't around for that stuff, but I mean, those pilots, they were great. <laughs> I mean, early Air Canada guys and your guys, uh, the same thing. They operated on that system. That's right. Yeah. When I mentioned uh, 53,000 pounds gross weight, the uh, airplane had so many different variations, and some of them were 58,000 pounds, some were 72,000 pound gross weight takeoff, so modified versions, but... We are limited to 53 because it's a maximum landing weight. All right. Now, the Lancaster has uh, three fuel tanks in each wing, 580 gallons in the number one, 383 in the number two, and 114 in the number three on each wing. Out of the 580 in the number one tanks, we could dump fuel. Well, when we got the airplane, in order to keep that dump system working, and how many times are we going to fly it around with 2,454 gallons total? We wouldn't be. Yeah. Did when we went to England, but 
in order to activate and certify that system, it'd be have to check every year. So they decided, let's uh, wire the system closed and we'll limit the takeoff weight to the gross weight landing, which we did. Now the dump system, Trev, when you activated the dump, it was on the floor by the pilot's foot and you just turn the red handle and these two big hoses would drop out under pressure from the number one tanks. All right. And dump your fuel. You could dump down to 100 gallons. So you're dumping 480 gallons, 1,000 gallons, basically, you're getting rid of. Yeah. And that's uh, 7,000 pounds. So if you really got stuck, in addition to your auto boost and your maximum power, you could dump 7,000. That might just buy you some time, you know, to climb. At least enough to get away from the ground. Yeah, And, and exactly. maybe give some guys, you know, a chance for some guys to get out if you needed to. The uh, Lancaster, towards the end of the war, was getting geared up to fly into the uh, Asian conflict. Of course, that did come to an end, and I did yeah. mention it almost had a role in the uh, atomic bombs, but it brought a lot of young women back to Canada, too, the war brides, Trevor. And there were various versions. Of the, I mean, we talked about the Manchester. There was a Lancaster. There was a Lincoln, which was a Lancaster with the two-speed, two-stage supercharger. So that was the bigger engine with the paddle blades instead of the needle blade propellers. Okay. The York and the Lancastrian, gain Lancasters basically, but these were passenger airplanes. The Lancastrian was used to carry fuel in and out of Berlin during the conflict. It's got some great history. And then, of course, the great big Shackleton bomber was a version of the Lancaster that had the Griffin engine, which was Rolls-Royce. That's a 2,000 horsepower engine plus. Now, Trevor, i got to mention, Rolls-Royce named all of their piston engines after birds of prey. So you had the Hawk, the Eagle, the Condor, the Vulture, the Griffin. And when you get to the Merlin, as a kid, I always believed the Merlin was because England needed a miracle and Merlin the magician, right? Yeah, yeah. But no, Merlin is also a bird. It's a pigeon hawk. I've had that pointed out to me by one of our young (laughs) students that come to the museum. And of course, the Griffin is the imaginary bird. Rolls-Royce also built sleeve valve engines, which were very successful, although we didn't see a lot of them. The Hercules on the Lancaster was a sleeve valve engine. I saw that in our notes there. Yeah. 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 It's incredible how much conflict drives innovation, that need for whatever it is, and you're going to get a lot of smart people working on it. And we see that here with the vaccines, with the yep. uh, coronavirus yes. and, and everything else, and, and how many different places are coming up with a vaccine. That's all well and good. And, and this is just one of those examples from history. This is awesome. It is. It's mother of invention, right? It's always a disaster or war is the mother of invention. And we come along. There was a gentleman named uh, Dr. Stanley Hooker. When he was uh, brought into the Rolls-Royce company, he believed that a four-stroke engine was one stroke for power and three strokes to wear the engine out. He was a real advocate of the two-stroke engine. Rolls-Royce built, it was a sleeve valve, two-stroke, liquid-cooled V12 called the Creasy. Now, they didn't name it after a bird because it was two-stroke. They named it after a battle, the Battle of Creasy, wherever that was. But this guy, (laughs) this Dr. Hooker, he used first principles of calculus to reveal an error in the scoop of the Spitfire. You know the spoop, that beautiful scoop underneath the nose of the Spitfire, but yes. also on the intake of the supercharger. Oh. And using first principles, he was able to recalculate the curves and increase the power by 5%. And that was significant during the war. Oh, definitely. Any little bit helps for sure. These engines, uh, you know, thanks to our wonderful friends just to the south where you are, World War II, as it was uh, gearing up, All of the Merlin engines, all of the engines in England were running on 80, 87 octane fuel. Mm -hmm. Just before the war, while you were under the treaty, the neutrality treaty prevented Mm -hmm. you from doing things like this. But the Americans managed to get a tanker full of 100 octane fuel into England, which supplied England for the Battle of Britain. I mean, let's face it. If the Battle of Britain had been worn, we'd probably all be speaking German by now, yeah. which is nothing wrong with that. No <laughs> nice language. But yeah, they got the 100 octane in and it increased the boost by five pounds. That's 10 inches on the, as these carburetors were all adjusted. Yeah. yeah. You look at all those stories and you hear this one little thing did this thing and the domino effect that allowed, you know, follow on advancements or victories or the list goes on and on. But yeah, that's amazing stuff. For this aircraft, we'll transition into where have we seen it before? And I think you mentioned a few things towards the beginning of the interview of terms of movies. You've talked about the Reunion of Giants, the one that you guys put together when you took the aircraft over there. 
any other places? I think you maybe mentioned the Dam Busters movie. Is that right? Well, the Dam Buster, it's a great movie. It really is. It's an old black and white and superimposed explosions and things like that. I mean, what else are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. Put actual firing up there. But it's a great film and it's a great story. But of course, like everything else, Trevor, we're starting to rewrite history. Yeah. They're starting to say now that maybe we didn't have to drop the bomb on Nagasaki. Maybe we didn't have to blow the uh, dams, but we weren't there at the time. Sure. You know, there was a great threat of an invasion in England. It was only a 22 mile channel at the narrow spot there. And they had the boats, they could get the men over. So the dams had to go because it was a strategic bombing and they wanted to wipe out the industries. When they hit Dresden and uh, Cologne, they wiped out 60 to 70% of the uh, production on engines and ball bearings and things like this. But, you know, resilience. Within two weeks, they were up and at it again. They're up and making stuff. Incredible. It is incredible. Especially considering when you look at the pictures of the damage from yeah. all of those places and how absolutely devastating it was to, as a people, come back and get back into a war fighting mentality and spirit. Now, granted, maybe there's a little bit of uh, an impetus from leadership and whatnot, and we can talk politics later. But all that being said, you know, the resiliency of the human spirit is definitely amazing for sure. Trevor, there was a raid on Coventry. My dad's sister was killed in Coventry on that raid. Now, she would have been very young. Sure. She was still killed there. A lot of people died in Coventry, and this was after they had cracked the Enigma Code. All right. They knew the raid was going to Coventry, but they didn't want to reveal their hand. Now, what they did do was move fighters from 11 group up to 12 group so they could catch these people, the, the German airmen coming back from the raid, but they let the raid go. Yeah. You know, Churchill took quite a beating over that, but it was the right thing to do because they started locating, due to the Enigma, and a friend of mine, uh, one of our members who lives in the States, he has an Enigma machine. I got to see it and touch the dials on it. But this machine, once they could crack the code, they knew where the submarines were going to be. And by that time, the, the Canadian Corvettes, the ship, they had the ASDIC on it. that They could also figure out not only the depth, but the range and depth on the uh, submarines. And they just, just slaughtered these. Instead of bypassing the submarines, they were taking the convoys right into the packs so the Corvettes could destroy them. And they did this towards the end of the war. But prior to that, there was some uh, pretty bad devastation. I mean, but that was Enigma. That was it. Obviously, we have a lot of you know advantage, hindsight being 2020 and all the normal history revealing itself through time and interviews like this and, and everything else. And a lot of people would look back and say, that's incredible devastation, what needed to happen. And at the time, that's all they had to go off of. And when you look at history, people are making choices based off the information they have at the yes. time. And that's all they have to go off of. You know, I always put things into perspective in that yeah. respect. From your experience, your 500 plus hours of flying the Lancaster and the stories you've listened to and everything else, what are some of the things that you like the most, I guess, about the aircraft when it comes to piloting it around? And what have you heard others say they've appreciated the most about it? Well, there's six of us that fly the Canadian Lancaster. We are the six who were there at the right time. And I mean, there's thousands and thousands of pilots that can be trained to fly the Lancaster, obviously. We are the six that were lucky enough to be there and do it. And you never forget the honor. You never forget what the bomber stood for, what it was designed for. It was a weapon of mass destruction. There's no getting around that. Yeah. It also brings back the memories of the veterans, and that's what we're all about. It's all about veterans for us. We acquire airplanes that we document them and maintain them, uh, restore them, and fly them, the airplanes that the Royal Canadian Air Force work. But we never forget where that airplane came from. So I am very proud to fly it. I'm very careful with it. We're careful all the time. It's a little uh, redundant to say something like that, but <laughs> you do happen to think it's a tailwheel airplane, Trevor, and crosswind landings, uh, she can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you close the throttles, uh, those four engines don't come back like they've got, uh, what would, did we call that power control system on the Airbus? The uh, the ability to provide thrust instantaneously? Oh, those two engines would run up and run back on the 320, identical in power. These don't. You push four throttles up, Yep. one might go ahead, 
four <laughs> might go ahead. And because the tail and your uh, P factor and the gyroscopic action and the torque and the slipstream effect, this airplane wants to go to the left on takeoff. Sure. It had a crosswind into it. When we took it to England, we were dealing with crosswinds all over the place, you know, and you wonder who designed the runways. <laughs> it is a pleasure, but you don't want to be the guy that damages it. Oh, yeah. Who wants to damage any airplane, you know? But we do fly it in memory of the veterans. It's a living, flying memorial. For us, there were 150,000 men in Bomber Command, 55,000 of them. 55,500 of them died, and 10,695 were Canadians. Trevor, when we were in England, we were up in Bomber Country, which is uh, the Shire of Lincoln, Lincolnshire. Yep. And uh, there's so many bomber bases up there. That's how they managed to put a thousand lanks in the air on a raid. But mm-hmm. we went into some pubs, and the first pub we went into, especially when we first got over there to investigate whether it was feasible for this operation, we get in the pub, and there's beams, low beams, typical pubs, and there's coins in the beams. So we inquired, is it tradition? You stick a coin in? No, no, he says, you can't touch those. They're uh, from the airmen. In the war years, the men would, uh, or women, I guess, if they were in combat, but They would buy their beer and put the coins into the cracks in the beams to take them back when they came home. And you can go all over Lincolnshire in the pubs and there's coins in the beams everywhere. Oh, my goodness. You know, that doesn't give you a chill and a lump in your throat. So our airplane had an engine failure while we were in Middleton St. George. And uh, we lost number four engine. The supercharger failed. And actually, the supercharger, the axle that that compressor spins on, had mm-hmm. seized. And uh, so he lost the engine. And the boys were on final, so they just landed the airplane. But it took. we switched engines in three days with the British Rolls-Royce Merlin, as okay. opposed to our Detroit Merlins, Packard Merlins. We could change it in three days. But that was the airport that Andrew Minarski went on his fateful trip to raid Cambrai, the railway yards in France. No kidding. He left that airport. We thought about that while we were up there, too. I hadn't flown up there. I had the day off that day, but I ended up having to go up with supercharger parts that we brought across back from Canada. Mm -hmm. In the hangar, you just wonder, you know, this is where the boys left, and a lot of bombers were up there. There were three squadrons per air base up there. Yeah. We'd fly passengers out of another airport up there to, you know, help raise funds. In a 20-minute flight, we'd fly over 50 bomber fields. It was amazing that that's how they won the war. You look across the southwest of the United States and you'll find old auxiliary fields that they used. I was at Luke Air Force Base and there's a bunch of them out there. You can kind of see them. They're starting to fade into into the memories and civilization is coming over top of it and all that stuff. But they're still out there and there's some hidden gems out there like the coins and the beams and and that kind of thing. The Commonwealth Air Training Plan, it was a wonderful plan because they could build airports and hangars all over Canada, which they did. And nobody was attacking them. The trainers could get up and uh, no fear of a Messerschmitt running around. I, I talked to an old friend, Jan Falkowski, who's a Polish fighter pilot. He was an instructor in the war, and he's got his students in a biplane and Messerschmitts shooting at him. But they didn't have that. And all of our airports in Canada were triangular in shape. Yep. Some of them had parallel runways, but they all had the same hangars. Our museum was home to one of those hangars that caught fire. It was an old World War II hangar. Then we, of course, built our new hangar. You have to look it up, Trevor, and, and yeah. see our museum. Commonwealth Air Training Plan trained 150,000 pilots for the war effort in safety. They lost a few, of course, but uh, yeah. That's an invaluable thing. I, you, know, you, you look at being in England, being in France, being in yeah. Germany, and trying to bring new pilots on the line yeah. in the middle of war, like you said, and people are shooting at you when you're just trying to learn how to fly an airplane. Yeah, That's an amazing thing for especially the ones that were able to make it through and, and live beyond the end of the conflict. Well, you mentioned, obviously, that uh, we can go look up the museum. What's the website we can go look at? If you just put in Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum, CWHM, mm-hmm. it'll bring you right to the site. All right. You can look at the airplanes and the cost of flying and everything else. It's- we'll get a full-on link in the show notes there for people to click on. I think we can probably kind of read between the lines there, but what's the purpose of the museum? What are we trying to accomplish by having this museum and everything associated with it? There were four forefathers of the museum, Dennis Bradley, I think, being the main one, and his son is flying with us now. Dennis has since passed away. We lost one in an accident, and the other two have since left us, passed away. Mm -hmm. But there were four businessmen that wanted to get 
a warplane airplane, a, a vintage aircraft. The one they picked was the Ferry Firefly, which it's a folding wing Navy airplane. It looks like a, a little bit like a Spitfire, but it's a bigger airplane. It's 12,000 pounder. It's a big airplane. And they got that airplane. Then other airplanes came along, including the B-25. I don't think Dennis ever envisioned that the museum would be the size it is now. In our new facility now, uh, we have an AMO, we have an approved maintenance organization, so we can do our own maintenance. We have a, a great engineering shop. We have all the tools and equipment and four engineers working. Plus, we have a great CEO who, uh, without him, uh, we would never have gone to England with this airplane, and that was a great boom to our economy. I'm sure. But 42 airplanes in the group, and you can touch them. The kids, there are some that they can sit in, uh, of course, some that you can't because we're f- still flying those. Yeah. But it's a hands-on museum. We put twenty to 30,000 school kids a year on approved programs, educational programs, through our museum. Oh, wow. That is a great thing because uh, before COVID struck us, You'd have five or six school buses there daily. They'd leave by two o'clock, but it was an income for us as well. Oh, yeah. And we had great little hands-on training devices. And some of those kids would then end up bringing back, you know, their parents, come and see this dad, your mom, you know, it's great. We get the benefit of that. That's great. Our mandate, as I had mentioned earlier, is uh, we acquire, maintain, document, and restore aircraft that the Canadian Armed Forces flew. We have one stranger in our fleet, but uh, it's a yak. But anyhow, but that's what we're all about. And we fly for the veterans. You said you had 42. You covered, obviously, the lengths there, the fireflies there. What yak is it? We have a yak five. It's in the colors of the Chinese aerobatic team. But we have uh, a Beach 18, which that was the first twin tailwheel airplane I'd ever flown. I've got a lot of time on that one. Mm-hmm. been flying that for 16 years, I guess now, but a C-47 and a DC-3. Now, right now, the DC-3 is sitting in a hangar in Brantford without its engines. We're having them restored. Now, those are the right cyclones like you'd have in the B-17. Okay. The C-47 has the Pratt & Whitney, the 14 cylinders, and we have a B-25, of course. We have a Lysander, which had come to some grief. The Lysander has a Bristol Mercury engine, not a sleeve valve, but it's a round engine. Okay. We had an engine failure with it, and... Uh, one of our pilots, Ricky Rickards, uh, he managed to put it down in a field of corn and did some damage, but saved the airplane. It's a strange airplane to fly, automatic flaps and slats. And oh my. We also um, are doing a restoration on a Bristol Bowling Brook. The British call it the Blenheim. Okay. We have a Navy tracker with folding wings, and we have just prepared, we have an Avenger, which will fly. We lost the Avenger in the Great Fire back in 1993. This is a restored, another one. This is that fire that you were saying that they had to pull the link out from? Yes. Yeah. We lost a Spitfire, a Hurricane, an Avenger, and what else did we lose in it? A Stinson and an Oster. But uh, we do have a Norseman, which is a wonderful bush plane. It's uh, spent its life on floats. We put it on wheels, and I'll tell you, we struggled with that old girl. It's a single-engine, high-wing bush plane. I love flying it. It's a great airplane, but it took us a while to figure out how to put it down on the ground. <laughs> uh, we have two Harvards, and we have a Stearman. We have two Cornells and two Chipmunks and two Tiger Moths. So. What an array. Now, those are the flying airplanes. Now, we have a lot of military jets that don't fly. and sure. We have a PBY, the uh, Cancel. Okay. Now, are you guys in line? Obviously, Canada has F-18s and him and Han about what the future looks like for the next fighter for them. And so on. are you guys in that line of systems in the U S we have, you know, the air force museum system basically. And they, they kind of get, if you will, first dibs on existing aircraft when they are no longer military service. Do you guys get that kind of preference? Well, we have in the past, we have uh, received some of the airplanes. We have a, a CL-44, the Tudor, and we have an F-86 Sabre, which is a lovely airplane, you know. Yeah. It was a lovely airplane, of Korea you know, vintage. Mm-hmm. But um, there have been some movements to get jet aircraft here. All right. Well, with a jet aircraft, you're talking different speeds, Trevor. If the pilot gets to the spot where he's got to eject and leave a passenger in that airplane, he might as well dig a hole and stick, you know, because, yeah. and it's like the, some of the organizations that we have are flying around with passengers with parachutes on board. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get out of the airplane and are you going to leave a passenger behind? So you're going to have to find a better way down. Yeah. So we don't carry parachutes. And uh, I just tell people, if you do jump out, just bend your legs, uh, you know, when you're 
<laughs> when you touch down. It's that simple. It's, it's that simple. So we do, there has been some uh, incidents this past few years with their vintage aircraft. And of course, the FAA are looking at it and our Canadian aviation regulations, our Transport Canada people are looking at it. We do the best we can to fly properly. We operate under a certificate. We operate under a private operator certificate as well as the exemption I mentioned. But we train to a 703 regulation, which means every year we're doing annual checks, ground schools. Every two years we have to do competency checks on the uh, the aircraft that are over 12,500 pounds. We keep a very professional approach to this, Trevor. We have to. We expect that out of the pilots. I expect them to write their exams and know the airplanes and uh, be able to answer questions. And As you should. Yeah, as you should, exactly. Professional pilot, that's your responsibility. Yep. Well, you offer rides like we've discussed. Do you guys offer a training program to become certified to fly the aircraft? No, and that's been brought up a few times because where do you get a tailwheel checkout in the first place? So as a result of this uh, exemption I mentioned, in order to fly with our museum, you have to have a class one medical All right. and uh, you have to have 50 hours of tailwheel time. Okay. And if there's a spot in our organization when we need a pilot, we'll bring them in and we start them on the chipmunk and the Cornell, basically get them used to our culture. And then we'll move them on to the tiger moth or to the Harvard and Stearman or maybe the beach 18, but there is a hierarchy and there is a plan. Okay. So it's not a, a no way. It's just, you're not going to jump right into the lank right away kind of deal. No, no. And <laughs> as much as some might want to, we get a lot of people, especially right now that a lot of pilots are um, furloughed, of course, and uh, they want to come over and fly the museum. Well, it, we can't train everybody. We because well, put it this way: we make fourteen thousand four hundred dollars in revenue when we fly the Lancaster for one hour. Wow! So, according to the exemption, we have to put a minimum of five hours of training into that airplane. You're looking at seventy five, eighty five thousand dollars. That's a minimum. Well, we don't have five hours to waste, and we can't. Nobody's going to be paying fifteen thousand dollars an hour to learn to fly the airplane. Yeah. Unless you're a millionaire, I guess. But <laughs> so the six pilots that are on the airplane have been on it for a considerable amount of time. But right now, I am in the process of training a pilot. All right, uh, he's been with us longer than I have. I've been there for 21 years. He's been there a bit longer. He's flown the Firefly and he's been flying Harvard like since as long as I have. Mm-hmm. He flies the Beach 18 and the DC3. So he's the next logical person to go up. But we can't afford this year. To give him five hours of training. So we'll, after all the work we do with him, I do hours and hours in the evening. It's not on the airplane. We do it on the phone and we'll give him one hour of training, maybe a couple of hours of training this year and then finish it next year. He's young, so he can do that. Yeah. But if we're only going to fly at 25 hours this year, that's 280000 in revenue or so that we need. You yeah. Know, so. Are you guys, when it comes to maintenance on the aircraft, are you guys, like you said, you have a pretty good, the AMO that you had mentioned, are you guys pretty much self-sufficient when it comes to creating parts and and everything like that? Or are you guys kind of hunting and pecking for pieces? Yeah, we hunt and peck. And uh, there's always somebody that's bringing in a carburetor or uh, some old valves or whatever you have. You know, sometimes we have to borrow parts from museums. In the past, we've had to borrow uh, ailerons or I'll give you an example. We fly the airplane two years ago. I was with our chief pilot, chief uh, executive officer, uh, Dave Rohr, and uh, we're doing a training flight. We were going to land at London, Ontario, which was 40 minutes away, and he decided, no, let's take it down to Windsor because we have a new engine hanging on the wing, and let's give it a nice long flight, which we did. We landed in Windsor, Ontario, and uh, retracted the flaps, and the flap handle broke came off in our hands. The flaps are fully extended. Well, we can't take off. We have no way of retracting them. Oh, no. So at that point, though, there's a museum down there called the Canadian Historical Aircraft Association, and they are restoring a Lancaster to taxiing level. Wow. So we went in and said, hey, guys, we just broke our flap handle. Oh, take this one, which we did. <laughs> Had we landed in London, Ontario, we'd have been stuck. Yeah. I mean, what are the odds, Trevor, that you fly into a place like that? And uh, these boys were so quick to help with us. They have parts, we have parts, and we're all like you guys down there. Oh, yeah. Just sharing and and trying to keep everything flying or or to whatever level of repair that you possibly can. That's great. What do you guys have coming up here in 2021? 
that people could go see if anything. And I know obviously the world is pretty crazy right now, but do you yeah. guys have anything out there that you're planning on attending or just a couple of days ago? I think I talked to you about it. We canceled the uh, rotary. Uh, it's an air show in mid August. It uh, occurs on a Wednesday, last Wednesday in the month or so. Right. We just canceled that this year. It didn't go last year either, but yeah. this year we've canceled because there's, we have no idea what COVID is going to do. And every year, Father's Day, we have Fly Fest. We have uh, we reduce the rates. What we do there is we have a daily membership. So you're not paying the full membership. We can reduce the price. And you get lots of people out there, Trevor. And it's exciting. The weather's good. We get out airplanes running around everywhere. We fly all of the airplanes that day. Everything. All right. At your home base? Yes, in Hamilton, Ontario. Yep. But this year, we won't have it. We didn't have the Fly Fest last year. And everybody loves it. The staff loves it. The pilots all love it. And the passengers, of course, and the kids. And we bring in a, an announcer and play music and explain, have interviews with veterans. And it's an exciting time, which, with the exception of the teams, you know, the jet teams, uh, our snowbirds and your yeah. Blue Angels and Thunderbirds, etc. That's what we're going to be seeing this year, I guess. Yeah, it is kind of a sad reality that we live in that this thing is has taken so much away, not only in obviously life and and not to downplay that by any stretch. When we're doing our training flights, we do try not when we're doing any maneuvers. I mean, what maneuvers do we do? We take it out, we'll stall it, and uh, it's a gentle stall with the airplane. But we try to uh, fly it over the local community. So when we do our member rides, we come out of Hamilton and we head straight towards Niagara Falls, or we'll go up the other side of the lake to Toronto cut across the lake to Niagara Falls, but we try to fly it over as many communities as we can so that so many people can hear it. Believe it or not, we do get the occasional complaint about noise. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so it's a typical of warbirds like that. You don't need to be low. A thousand feet, which is our minimum altitude, and in Toronto, we have to go higher. Niagara Falls, we have to be at 3,500 feet above yeah. ground, of sea level. You can still hear it. Oh, yeah. And uh, and most people love it. I know I would if I was able to hear that. I tell people the engines are so loud that the damage to my ear is such that I can only hear half the things my wife tells me to do anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that up to your discretion, whether it's uh, on purpose or not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we were talking about the B-25, we asked the question of, you know, how loud is it? And the B-25 is configured, obviously, a little it bit is. differently and, yeah. and whatnot. But the disadvantage of that is... The cockpit is literally right by yeah. the propeller. Is it as deafening, would you say, a noise as the B-25? Because I know you guys have a B-25 up there. Is that accurate? We tell our passengers during the takeoff roll, once we put the power up, take your headset off just for a moment so you can hear the noise and then put them back yeah. on. <laughs> as I said, Trevor, we're only using nine pounds of boost for takeoff. It's capable of 14 pounds with a lot of power we're not using. Yeah, B-25 is loud. Interesting thing, too, the B-25 has a castoring nose wheel. Correct. Right? You can ground loop a B-25. Well, so can you ground loop tailwheel airplanes. And the Lancaster has a tailwheel. All of the British aircraft have castoring tailwheels. Mm -hmm. You know, the Harvard, during takeoff, I don't know if you've flown to Harvard, you pull a stick right back and you lock the rudders to the tailwheel, and you get about 15 degrees of controlled movement on that wheel. All right. But once you go forward with the stick to lift up the tail, you better be off the ground because now it's a caster and that's what you got to remember when you land. But the DC three C 47, the American airplanes all have locking tail wheels. Mm -hmm. Beach 18 does mm -hmm. why the Brits have elected not to use a locking tail wheel is beyond me, but we just have to be careful. You know, ground loops occur after the tail is settled. You think you're home free and she's rolling down the runway and you've lost your vertical fin effect and your elevators aren't effective anymore. You've got brakes, and power and rudder. And that's all you've got. And if, if you can't keep it straight with the brakes, you put on the power. And if that doesn't work, put on full power, get off the ground and come back and try it again. And this time be a little bit more awake, you know? <laughs> yes. Don't let your guard down. Yeah. It's the lesson I'm hearing out of all this thing. This has been fantastic. And I can assure you that everybody that listens to this podcast wants to come out and check out the aircraft, get a ride in it, if they wanted to, there is a way for them to donate. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Yeah. On our website, there is a, an opportunity for them to do just that or to uh, look at the schedule for the airplanes or to book a flight, whatever they want to do. Okay, perfect. Yeah. We have an online shop as well, by the way. So uh, 
That's right. Yeah. I'm, I've pulled up your website and it's www. It's an awesome one. www.warplane.com. Like it's not it's more yeah. simple than that. And it's very pointed. So yeah, everybody, please go out, check that out. www.warplane.com. No spaces, dashes or otherwise. And you can see all this amazing stuff that they have at the museum. Do you guys have opportunities to volunteer as well beyond just donating? Do you guys have volunteers that come in and support the museum and, and help work on airplanes or any of that kind of thing? Every year, our CEO, Dave Rohr, mentions that we do 55,000 volunteer hours a year. And that if he had to pay minimum wage to the volunteers, he couldn't keep the museum open longer than a day. Yeah. So all of the pilots are uh, volunteers. I'm the chief pilot and I am a volunteer also. I do have a, a shared office. You know, I'm a pilot. I don't need to have a, a complete office, but I do with a flight coordinator. Uh, she's a wonderful lady and she, we have the files for all of the pilots, which we keep for, you know, I need to know their licenses are, are valid, their medicals are valid, what uh, endorsements they have, what ground school training they've done in the past, the, the uh, annual and the initial. We keep all of that stuff for years, and uh, we have been audited by Transport Canada. They're happy with what we're doing. I feel we have a very safe operation. We do, but we have to. Oh, absolutely. It is all volunteers. And then, in addition to those volunteers, we uh, each airplane has its own volunteer crew. There's the Lancaster crew. Of course, they've got the queen of the fleet, as far as they're concerned. Yeah. And then you've got the C-47, and they think the same thing. And the PBY, there's different groups of uh, volunteers that come out. And uh, when we're flying these airplanes, these are the guys that come out and do the pre-flight inspections, checking the oil, adding oil, checking tire pressures, and washing the airplanes. Uh, somebody has to do it, and these guys do it. There's no complaining. They're just happy to do it because they know with a radial-engined aircraft, you clean that thing up and you take off. And uh, it's covered in oil by the time you get back, you know. It's like it was never cleaned. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. But that's what they do, and they know the history of the airplane, so they'll go away at air shows when we could do that. Yeah. And they'll tell you what you need to know about those airplanes, who did what. Most of our, not most of our, I guess uh, some of our aircraft were the recipients of Victoria Crosses. Now, Andrew Minarski received a Victoria Cross posthumously. It was one week after the war ended. Nobody would have known what his actions were unless the tail gunner had survived. We wouldn't have known what he did. Yeah. But how many other incidents of heroism were there where there was nobody around to repeat it? Know. You know, and I think about that, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and who is that guy, you know, or, or a woman? Yep. So amazing. it's all about volunteers for us. As I said, I worked on a Bolingbroke bomber for uh, four years doing riveting and learning about metals. And I learned more about airplanes, Trevor, and four years there than I had in years. Oh, know, I'm sure. A different education, you know. Oh, absolutely. You get to know an aircraft pretty closely when you're sitting yeah. there working on it, for sure. Well, Leon, this has been absolutely amazing. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to make this a reality and uh, keep this aircraft alive and even more so up in the air. Again, the website for the uh, museum is www.warplane.com. We'll make sure that's in the show notes and anything else that we've discussed here. We'll talk offline about getting that Reunion of Giants movie and seeing where the listeners can see that or where they can find anything else that's related to uh, your Lancaster specifically and then the Lancaster in general. In general, anything else that uh, you want to mention before we start uh, heading off the air? I don't think so, Trevor. I think we covered a lot more than I was expecting to. And <laughs> It always happens. It's good. But uh, I do have this habit of talking. Yeah, I talk a lot. So <laughs> My wife would say the same thing, so don't worry. You're not alone in that respect. This is our love, right? So, I mean, why wouldn't we? If you're not passionate about something in your life, hopefully you can all find it. But uh, I know from what I see, I'm you know fortunate enough to get to see you here, but the listeners are only going to get to hear your voice. I can tell that you have a love and a passion for this and obviously volunteering your time, your uh, career of aviation before coming into the museum. And obviously, since you've retired from the airlines and have been flying Lancaster and working at the museum it's clear that you have a passion for this and it takes people like you to keep this kind of history alive and well for the younger generations. And we've mentioned it, if not specifically in generalities, you know, those that don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. So uh, yeah, we, yeah. the more we can uh, take from the lessons of the past and apply to the future, the better, I think. So before we let you go, typically this is a uh, fighter centric kind of a tradition, but do you have a call sign by chance? 
Yes, I do. Oh, it's uh, Mad Dog. Mad Dog. All right. Yeah. How did that come to be? My uh, girlfriend had a dog, and I was trying to impress the family, and I was leaving, and I just reached down to pat the dog on the head, but it was a stray dog that they'd found. And the damn thing almost took my fingers off, came up my leg and biting me all, all over the place. I had to drive to hospital with my hands straight out because I couldn't curl them around the steering wheel. Had to get my needles and everything else. So they just thought Mad Dog would be very appropriate. So, <laughs> that's a great one. <laughs> so that's it. That's how I got that. Anyhow, I was going to be severely disappointed if it was just yeah. something you came up and named yourself. No, that's a great story. No, that's no. A Her mother is saying to me, why are you taking the food out of the dog's mouth? I had both hands. I was holding the jaws. Uh -huh. I guess what she saw was that thinking I'm trying to get his food. Like, I don't want the dog's food. I want the dog to stop biting. You know, <laughs> that's Jesus. fair. That's yeah. fair. It's not pleasant. Well, Leon, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up uh, right here. I want to thank you once again for your, uh, taking the time to uh, talk about the aircraft and everything that you've brought to the table. It's been great. So for uh, Leon, and I'm going to refer to the Lank as uh, Vera, okay. but for the Lancaster, everybody out there, thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next time. Well, welcome back, everyone. My thanks again to Leon for an amazing in-depth look at the Lancaster and the operation up there at the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum. And just what a fascinating story about finding that airplane, pulling it off the uh, sticks, as we like to say, and getting it restored. The story of having it fly across the Atlantic Ocean again and meeting up with its counterpart, the only other flyable model in England, and them getting to walk through the pubs and see the coins and the beams and all that kind of stuff from all the airmen that were never able to return. And just an amazing legacy to be a part of all that history and heritage associated with that aircraft specifically, just staggering numbers of losses. I can't even fathom what that looks like seeing those in the newspapers and, and everything else like that. Just absolutely incredible. But I really do appreciate Leon taking the time to talk with me through all that amazing history and everything that he's been able to experience. I have seen the video that he did end up sending to me and I'll tell you what, it's great. So if you can head over to the website, www.warplane.com, you can buy yourself a copy and I'll tell you what, I can't wait to head up north and visit the museum and hopefully see Vera in person, maybe even catch a flight. And then uh, just all the other pieces of aviation history that they have up there and get to experience all that firsthand would just be really fun and kind of awe-inspiring if you ask me. So again, for anybody that's interested in supporting the museum, please head on over to their website, www.warplane.com. And you can find pictures and additional details about Vera specifically, and then all the other aircraft that are out there, how to volunteer and donate as well. So please do so if you uh, have the means available, get up there when it's possible and go check out that place. It's a fantastic museum. Well, I'm about to head back into the books. I'll tell you what, it was a nice reprieve from uh, studying uh, a new airplane, but uh, I'll resurface next month for our next Warbird episode on the renowned P-51 Mustang. Man, I'll tell you what, there's some good stuff out there and I'm hoping I was able to get everything coordinated well enough to uh, get my uh, friend from down at Sun and Fun to uh, jump on here with me as well. But uh, until then, Jello has a couple of great episodes lined up for you. I think you all probably know what's coming up. Episode 111 is finally here. And I think this is probably the most requested airplane since the F-14, the old fan favorite F-111. So with that, Jello, best of luck to you. And we'll see you here next month. As always, we'd like to mention that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the U.S. Department of Defense, the Canadian Department of National Defense, or their respective components. We'll see you next time for the next installment of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. But until then, get high get fast, and do some good work. We'll see ya. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com for exclusive content and to help support the show check out our patreon page thanks for listening